Awesome. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about uh, Codex uh, Democensis and the evolution of the Syrian reading tradition. So the title uh, uh, or the name Codex Democensis is a uh, preliminary title. Uh, it would usually receive a number, uh, but since there are a number of, of, of uh, uh, manuscripts that come from the uh, Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, hence the name Codex Democensis, uh, and they haven't been sorted through, uh, there's no number assigned to it yet, so I just kind of left it blank like that. So the first thing I want to do is kind of highlight the um, so, uh, the uh, physical uh, attributes and aspects of this manuscript. I've been uh, working on this manuscript for for a while, actually a couple couple years now. Uh, there are four folios held in uh, uh, in Paris Bibliothèque Nationale in in Paris uh, under Arab 6140A. Uh, four folios are there. There are two additional folios in uh, uh, Cambridge University Library uh, under the MSADD 1125 shelf mark. Uh, now, there are actually 30 or so more folios in the Turkish Museum uh, or the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts, also known as TM. I have a, an alert here. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> Uh, the, the folios uh, in TM have not been fully uh, cataloged, uh, so we're not really quite sure how many there are right now. As to a, a number of them, uh, and we'll be taking a look at them in a little bit. Now, like most, uh, if not all, uh, early Hejazi manuscripts, it's in a vertical format, so you can see it here on the left-hand side. And according to uh, Francois de Roche, this is in the uh, Hejazi 1 script. So this is one of the oldest uh, paleographic uh, script styles uh, of, of, of Quranic manuscripts. Uh, this specific manuscript is undated. Uh, by that I mean there is no colophon, there's no waqf that's, that survives, uh, and no radiocarbon dating has been done on this manuscript. Uh, in fact, it's particularly challenging for this mushaf because uh, the writing usually extends to the very edges. There aren't very large margins, so, uh, you know, a, a curator would frown upon uh, taking a, a portion of this manuscript for radiocarbon dating. But I, I really, I hope one day it, it will get radiocarbon dated. Uh, there are between 22 to 25 lines per page, uh, give or take. Uh, and what's very nice about this manuscript is that it has many different layers. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean that this, this uh, manuscript was originally written, so you can see the original consonantal uh, text, but then the manuscript was vocalized. So there are these red dots, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. And then there are verse separators, like this little red ha that we see right here on these dashes. Uh, and actually through investigation, you can find that n all of these different layers didn't happen at the same time. Uh, they took place over time. Uh, and what that allows us to do is study each layer independently uh, and look at how this manuscript evolved over time. Can we, based on looking at the different layers, can we say something about where the manuscript was held? Uh, where it might have been uh, 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 transported to back and forth, uh, et cetera. So, so the, the beauty of this is, is it's very layered uh, and it gives us a good picture into the tradition it represents. Now, between the folios that are in uh, Paris and in Cambridge, uh, those hold about four and a half percent of the entire uh, Quran. Uh, altogether with the folios from Turkey, it's about a quarter of the Quran. So it's a substantial, substantial percentage of the entire uh, text uh, of the uh, of the Quran, so it's a very interesting manuscript. All right, so uh, some aspects of the Mus'haf include verse separators. So you know, again, I talked about this layered history. So the first layer, as far as verse separators are concerned, are these sort of strokes, these sort of diagonal oblique strokes that uh, are usually about five or so stacked on top of each other that separate uh, each verse. Uh, and then someone later on came along and in certain places erased these original uh, stroke, these original verse separators and added five mark and a 10 mark. So the five mark here, this is a ha, it's represented by the Arabic letter ha. And this is part of the hisab al-jummal, the Arabic numeral system, where the ha represents five. Uh, and at a 10 uh, verse mark, what they, uh, what they did is they put a red circle and they surrounded it with this, a series of dots, a series of decorative dots. So this marks every fifth verse and every 10th verse is marked with this symbol right here. Now, one interesting thing, uh, aspect of the script grammar, as Thomas Milo calls it, of this mushaf uh, is actually the uh, yeah. So the word final yeah here. Uh, and so one interesting question is, 
you know, what governs uh, a scribe's decision to either write a normal yeah like this facing forward or a retroflex, a returning yeah like this. And, by, and, and so what I'm about to present here doesn't necessarily hold for every manuscript, uh, but it does for this one, uh, where the default uh, is, a re is a retroflex, yeah, uh, so returning, yeah, like this, except if the preceding letter is a wow or any letter that descends below the baseline, which I'm generalizing. I've only seen it with wow. And so it shows that the scribe had a sort of geometric considerations. They didn't want to uh, draw the uh, returning such that it didn't intersect with the wow, or at least perhaps considered it to be displeasing visually. Uh, so this is an interesting insight I, uh, into this aspect of the script grammar of this uh, particular manuscript. Now, uh, one thing I, I think I like to compare this mushaf with, this manuscript with, so on the left-hand side here, I have a folio uh, from uh, TM, from Turkey. Uh, and this one preserves a surah uh, uh, separator. So this preserves a transition, a surah transition. Uh, and I'm comparing it here to the very famous uh, Birmingham manuscript. Uh, and so you can see sort of visually, you know, they're both a Hijazi script uh, and they both have this very distinct Umayyad noon. So the noon here, the final noon uh, kind of has this very sharp, almost uh, L-shaped right here. Uh, and you can see it here as well. It's very distinct. Uh, the same kind of medial ha and, and many other similarities. Both manuscripts are about the same size. And uh, what's interesting, of course, is the Birmingham manuscript has been radiocarbon dated. There was only one test done on a single folio. Uh, so I would take this with a grain of salt, but it, it, it dated to basically the first half of the seventh century. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that in all the folios that I have seen for this mushaf, which preserves a uh, surah transition, um, it has been erased and written over uh, by a later hand in this more new style uh, script. Fatihat Surat Luqman, this is the opening of the chapter of Luqman, and then it, it lists the number of verses in the surah. Uh, but actually, if you zoom in a little bit, you can actually see remnants of what was originally there, sort of these black, these dark lines, a few dots here. Uh, and it's very reminiscent of the sort of uh, very primitive geometric artwork that you find in this manuscript as well, in the Birmingham manuscript, and a few other early Hejazi manuscripts as well. Uh, and so the reason I'm pointing out all these things is by all indications, this is just as old paleographically, uh, uh, maybe even, you know, certain codicological aspects as well. E orthography is very old. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, as the Birmingham manuscript, it just hasn't been radiocarbon dated. So I'm just kind, kind of trying to give you some perspective on the age of this manuscript. Now, as far as orthography is concerned, uh, it bears all the usual ha hallmarks uh, of an old uh, uh, Quranic manuscript. For example, uh, words like bi'ayatina, uh, you know, with, uh, our signs or with our signs, has an additional denticle, an additional yet here, uh, unlike the Cairo edition, which predominantly uses the spelling uh, bi'ayatina with a single yet. Uh, so, you know, some have hypothesized that this might represent the loss of Hemza. So this would be biayatina as opposed to biayatina. So the glottal stop is not uh, uh, articulated. Uh, and so this, this is present throughout this manuscript. Shait, so words like shait have an additional elif. Uh, it's very hard to say with these kinds of features whether, um, you know, they are absolute markers of, of archaicness uh, or of age. Uh, so if, for example, I find that this manuscript has the spelling of shait with an added elif, is that necessarily older than one that doesn't? We can't be so definitive about it, uh, but I'm pointing out these broad uh, orthographic features that all characterize an archaic manuscript. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, ba'is here has an additional elif uh, as well. Uh, and something interesting is words that are these, uh, uh, words like da'b, uh, okay, or nas uh, or qala uh, are usually, other than qala actually, are usually spelled, usually spelled plain A, so they have an elif. Uh, in this manuscript, though, the word da'b, da'aba, uh, is missing an elif, it's spelled uh, uh, defectively, so kada'b in, uh, right here, uh, and that's quite unusual to find. Uh, and so, uh, Marijn van Putin in a very nice paper it, it highlights the fact that, you know, spelling this word without an elif necessarily means that this word, whoever wrote this, was, was trying to represent kadab without a hamza as opposed to kadab with a glottal stop here, with a hamza. 
Uh, so we find that as well. Qala, uh, very interestingly, the, this manuscript, every, every instance of Qala that I saw was spelled defectively, so without an alif, qaf lam, except for a couple instances that I've highlighted right here. So only two of them. They chose to write as waqala here and qala right here. And so that brings up the question, and this is one of the open uh, uh, questions in the field, I would say, is what is the nature, what is the meaning behind the choice to write qala defective or to write it plainly with an alif. What does this mean? Is it part of a scribal tradition? Is it where certain regions or certain scribal schools uh, decided to write certain qala with alif and certain other ones without an alif? Nobody has studied manuscripts, uh, enough manuscripts systematically to answer this question. So it is an open question. Uh, and, uh, and it's a very interesting one because it can tell us something about the transmission history of these manuscripts beyond very coarse features like regionality, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we can see there's a scribal correction here. Uh, this is Qal ibn Um. He said, oh, son of my mother. And uh, in, again, this is a, a, a facet of early manuscripts where it wrote it, uh, Alif ba waw, so ibn Um, without the Hamza. And here's someone you can see. In fact, it's hard to say that this was much later. You know, it has that very distinct noon, uh, but maybe this tale of the Alif um, uh, might give away its age, but, but it looks like this adjustment was made uh, pretty early on in the life of this manuscript as well. So again, different orthographic features highlighting the age of this manuscript. Okay, so now this brings us to scribal errors. And I put errors in quotes here because some of them do appear to be errors and, and, and some of them are uh, were actually corrected by the original scribe. And we can tell this by the ink. Uh, so for example, Fahua was left out right here and it was added in by, uh, I mean, almost certainly the original scribe who left it out. There's a wow here as well. Uh, but there are some later corrections, like an edif right here that was definitely added later because you can see it's even vocalized uh, and things like that. And so there, you know, there, are, there are dozens of these sorts of uh, errors and corrections throughout this manuscript. And what I want to do is zoom in uh, and highlight a few interesting ones uh, that stood out to me. Uh, of course, also the study of these, these corrections and these scribal errors is very important to understand the evolution uh, of, uh, of certain variants uh, in orthography, like the one I showed before, Ibn Um, and also what we would consider to be non-canonical orthographic variants. Those are very interesting as well. Uh, and so with that, what I wanted to do is talk in a little more detail about some of the interesting uh, um, non Uthmanic, I will call them variants that I found in this manuscript. So in Q7, uh, verse 142, uh, there's the verse, وَأَتْمَمْ uh, Okay, وَأَتْمَمْ is the standard Uthmanic reading. This is the canonical text. Uh, and here we have وَتَمَّمْ and a later alif that was added. And this is just an em emphatic uh, 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 change in, in morphology here. Uh, but what's interesting is one might say, well, uh, how do we know that the scribe didn't just forget the alif? So the scribe meant to write وَتَمَّمْ نَاهَا, pardon, and they just forgot to write the alif. Uh, lucky for us, we can see that the scribe actually initially wrote an alif. So you can see the remnant of the alif, and then they scraped it away, and then they wrote تَمَّمْ نَاهَا, and someone later on added the alif in here. And so what that tells me, at least, is that the scribe was copying from an exemplar that had an alif in it, but consciously decided to erase it and go with a non-standard reading with tamam naha. Now, if you go through the traditional literature, you'll find that this variant is attributed to Ubay ibn Ka'b. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But then a couple of verses later, we have bi ahsaniha uh, in the feminine right here. And we can see here this ha and alif was added in later. And we can see the outline of an original ha that was here. So what was written was bi ahsanih in the masculine. Now, if you go through the traditional literature, you find this variant mentioned that it was read wa quri'a bi ahsanihi, or in this manuscript, it was, would be bi ahsanihu bi ghayri alifin ala tathkir in the masculine. But there was no reference to who uh, read this. So it was not attributed to anyone. Interestingly, again, uh, uh, one verse later, we have um, uh, this ver verse, yet, yeah, this word, which was originally written as 
we can see in the feminine, we can see the remnant of the alif and the shape, the letter shape of this ha is not uh, of a word final detached ha right here. This is uh, uh, an initial ha right there. Uh, interestingly enough, this variant is also attributed to Ubay ibn Ka'b. Now, this brings up a broader question, which is the question of companion readings. Uh, are these readings really uh, uh, the readings of, of companions, or are they back projections onto famous companions who did have dissenting uh, uh, readings compared to the canonized Uthmanic, what we call the Uthmanic standard Mus'haf? Uh, ultimately, without a more exhaustive study, it's impossible to say. But what I will say is in this case, what we find is a uniformity of attribution to Ubay, a very small sample size. Uh, but the other interesting thing we'll see is that this Mus'haf does have a Syrian provenance. Uh, not only was it found in a Syrian deposit, but there are other Syrian elements of this Mus'haf. And Ubay's reading was recorded uh, to have been popular in the Syrian region uh, before the uh, proliferation of the standardized Uthmanic recension. And so I just find that curious. I think the jury's still out. A lot of research has to be done on this, uh, but I just point this out because it's very interesting. Now, uh, as far as I'm aware, no one has systematically collected from the earliest manuscripts. I have a running list going actually uh, of, of companion readings that are found or so-called companion readings that are found in the earliest chronic manuscripts and they do die out over time. So they, they do fall out of favor uh, as the Uthmanic manuscript or the Uthmanic standard edition becomes more and more prevalent. Uh, but interestingly, uh, another manuscript that I'm currently studying and working on an edition of is uh, Arab 331. Uh, this is a bit later, late first century, early second century manuscript, a uh, beautiful Kufic B1, uh, B1A manuscript. And here you can see uh, in Surat al-Baqarah Q2, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ So the word, the standard reading has بِمِثْل, uh, and uh, in fact here it's not even vocalized as بِمِثْل, but you can clearly see Someone came in later on and added the bimithl in here or bimethali. Uh, and if you go through the literature, you find many reports, actually not one, but uh, in, in many of the earliest books, uh, Abu, uh, uh, Abu Ubaid, I'm not sure about Al-Farra, but very early, at least mid, mid uh, late second century uh, attributions of this reading to Ibn Abbas, uh, where it is said that Ibn Abbas disapproved of the Uthmanic reading of if they believe uh, in uh, what is like what you have believed in bimithli ma amantum bih. And he said that la taqra or do not read bimithl ma amantum bih, like that which you have believed in, because God uh, has no mathil, there is nothing like God, but rather you should read fa in amanu bima amantum bih. So if they believe in what you believed in, uh, now, this particular variant, very clearly, this was intended by the scribe of this manuscript. Uh, it's also purported to have been read by Anas ibn Malik, the famous companion, uh, and also ibn Mas'ud. Uh, so, uh, I, I, again, I just want to highlight this uh, to the general audience here to just uh, present to them that, that this is an open question right now and, uh, and a very fascinating area of study. And, uh, uh, you know, the closest thing I've seen to this was uh, Yasin Dunn has a paper that came out in 2017. Uh, that was titled, uh, When Do the Shawad Become Shav? Something like that. He doesn't quite look at companion readings, but he entertains the question of, uh, the fact of the matter is the earlier the manuscript, the more we find these sort of little remnants uh, of, of, of non-Uthmanic variants in them and they slowly die out. And so, so when were these variants considered to really be uh, non-canonical and unacceptable to have in manuscripts? Uh, and, it, and again, it's, it's an open question. So again, talking about provenance, let's, let's you know, the, the next layer would be, let's look at the verse separators. So here, uh, what I've done is I've picked out all the verses that occur in the, uh, the folios that I have studied, where there is a disagreement uh, either between this manuscript and among the, uh, the different uh, traditional uh, uh, attributions, uh, uh, verse count attributions, uh, pardon me. So here I use the same sort of uh, uh, illumination uh, to indicate a regular verse mark. And uh, I use this circle uh, with, uh, with a bunch of uh, smaller ones around it to denote a 10 uh, verse separator. So this Mus'haf is right here. Uh, and you can see that uh, this one has a 10, 10th verse marker right here, which agrees with everything but Kufa. Uh, and then Ala Bani Israel, this verse does not have a separator. 
Uh, and so uh, it only agrees with Basra, uh, Damascus, and Hems at this point. And so we can go through this exercise uh, and in list out all of them. We have a fifth one. Uh, and we can see here that the uh, five verse separator only agrees with the two uh, Syrian traditions. But then incorporating these last two verses, it becomes very clear that the Mus'haf here agrees with the Himsi to the exclusion of Damascus. And where Damascus has a verse separator, this Mus'haf does not. Uh, and so we can conclude from this that the manuscript appears to follow the Himsi, uh, the Himsi uh, verse counting tradition. Now, looking more into this, uh, I actually find something very interesting. Uh, there was one verse separator here that was added. You can see it's in a black ink, uh, or actually uh, two of them that were added here in black ink uh, that were later. They're crammed in. They don't fit in here nicely. Uh, and they don't actually work out with the uh, counts, the circles uh, that I mentioned, uh, that were added in by presumably uh, the same person. Uh, and what's interesting, and this, this brings up something which uh, I think has not yet been discussed in the literature or in Western literature at all, and uh, what I think has been misunderstood uh, in also the Arabic literature. And this is a concept what I have tentatively titled the pseudo verse separator. Uh, it looks like a verse separator uh, because it's, it's a series of dashes uh, or the same symbol that's used to mark a verse separator, but it wasn't counted as a verse separator. And how do we know this? We know this because it isn't included in the, uh, in the tally. So when we see a 10th verse separator and we count how many individual ones are in the middle, we find there might be 11 or 12. Now we could say that the person couldn't do math. It's possible. Maybe they made a mistake. But when you see this repeating pattern over and over again, it must point to something more. And if you go back to the literature and dig through the books, you find that early Muslim scholars mentioned this concept of what they called مَا يُشْبِهُ الْفَاصِلَ وَلَا يُعَدْ What looks like, uh, uh, what is similar to a verse separator, but is not counted. Uh, and so I believe that this might uh, basically be a reference to uh, uh, these pseudo verse separators. And they would be the equivalent of the modern day pausal sign. Like if you open a modern day Cairo edition or a Mus'haf, you'll find the jim, uh, a qaf, a sad, uh, which represent basically sentence breaks, natural places where you can pause. And because these sim symbols had not yet been invented or de developed, they just used the same symbol that they did to mark verse separators, but they didn't count them. Now, looking at the variants in this manuscript, the orthographic variants, this really clued me into something very interesting. So here in Surah Al-Anfal, Q8, verse 67, we have ma kana lin nabi, so with a definite article, uh, it is not uh, becoming uh, of the prophet, uh, compared to the standard reading of ma kana lin nabi, it's not becoming of a prophet. Uh, and this is found in, uh, in this manuscript, Codex Demosensis. It's also found in the British Library, famous uh, 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 British Library Mus'haf, which has been studied by Yassin Dutton and Intisar Rab, who both show that this manuscript is Syrian and Intisar in particular shows it is Himsi in provenance. Uh, and if we go through the literature, we find an interesting reference by uh, one Abu Hatim as Sijistani, uh, uh, mid third century uh, uh, scholar of, of readings and, and Quranic resum. And he says that in the Mus'haf of Hims, so very interesting, in the Mus'haf of Hims, the one that Uthman sent to Syria we find in Al-Anfal ma kana lin nabi with two lambs. So he mentions this variant and attributed, attributes it to uh, Hims. Uh, and he says that this Mus'haf uh, was sent by Uthman uh, to Hims. Now I show in other work uh, through a series of, 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 of including orthographic variants, but other evidences that it does seem very likely that this is a, a historical detail that was lost to time because nobody else uh, mentions this. Uh, that in fact, it seems likely that when the Quran was standardized, when the, let's call the Uthmanic standardization project took place, the Syrian Mus'haf was sent to Hems as opposed to Damascus, uh, which sort of would be what one would intuitively think because of the uh, uh, prominence of the Umayyad dynasty and the significance of Damascus to uh, the later Muslim empire. Okay, so uh, vocalization, a lot can be said. Uh, I am running out of time, I can see that. So what I'll say is there are many features like sulat uh, meme, uh, so the pronominal suffix here has a uh, vowel lengthening. This is typically an, a feature of uh, Hejazi readers among the canonical readers. So instead of minkum, they would say minkumu. 
Uh, what's interesting is the, the singular pronominal suffix uh, is actually unharmonized. Uh, so this is alayhu instead of alayhi, and this is not featured in any canonical reading. Uh, uh, what's also interesting is every single uh, singular pronominal suffix, uh, um, masculine at least, is unharmonized except for the word bihi, uh, which is harmonized. So it's bihi, but alayhu, ilayhu, ladayhu, etc. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I don't have much else to say about this other than I'm working on a study of this with Marijn Van Putten. So if you're interested in it, stay tuned uh, uh, for that work. It has hollow root imala. So this is a feature of uh, some Kufans and of Ibn Dhaquan, who is a transmitter of the Syrian reader, uh, Ibn Amr. So jaakum instead of jaakum, uh, uh, instead of daqat. Uh, this manuscript does feature hems, so mu'minun instead of mu'minun, sayyatikum, etc. So it has features like that. Uh, just make sure I'm not getting uh, uh, called out here. Uh, all right. Um, now, um, we can skip over that. Now, one interesting thing that we can do is also go through the, every single word in this manuscript and collect the farsh. So these are the individual variants of the words that we find in the manuscript. Uh, uh, and it, this applies to everything. So ba'isin versus bay'as, uh, uh, mithaqa, all kinds of things. Every single variation in the words uh, in this manuscript. Uh, and we can compare these variants to the different canonical readers. Uh, and what we find is we don't see that anyone really sticks out. We can see that this manuscript agrees mostly with Asim 22 times, but also with Hamza uh, 22 times, and then 21 times with Ibn Amr, and 21 times with Kisa'i, Ma'aqub. It's a mix. Nothing really stands out. Uh, and so this is where I, I want to move to a technique. Uh, it's a, it's a, a numerical analysis technique called diffusion maps. I, I, I can't hope to explain this to, to you uh, in this short amount of time, but it's basically a mathematical technique which allows us to take all of the information on farsh and usul, all of the, ortho, uh, the reading variants in this manuscript, digest them, and spit out a, a portrait that represents these variations. And so when we do that, and this is going beyond farsh because this incorporates usul, it incorporates rules, and it incorporates specific uh, variants. Uh, we can see here the star represents, I call it majhul, unknown, this unknown reading, and it lives up here. Uh, and what we can see is we have the, the uh, uh, Ibn Kathir, the Meccan, and Nafir, Medinan here, Abu Jafar, the Medinan here, and we have the Basrans here and the Kufans here, uh, generally speaking. And this hints at some regionality. We have the Iraqis, the people from Iraq, the Eastern readers out here, and they're separated pretty well based on uh, uh, Basra Kufa. And we have the Hijazis here, and we have this unknown manuscript, which perhaps might be Syrian up here. Uh, there is one exception to this, which is Ibn Ahmed, who's supposed to be a Syrian reader, and he's sitting all the way here in where we would expect to, to have a, a Iraqi reading. Uh, and so this, this tells us uh, something about, about his reading. Now, now, if we superimpose this on a map, uh, funny enough, we find that this lines up with the general geography of, of the Middle East here, where we have the Iraqis living in Iraq, the Hijazis, generally speaking, spanning the Hijaz, and this unknown manuscript all the way up here uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, uh, in Syria, where we might expect it. Uh, the only exception, as I mentioned, is Ibn Amr, and so what we can do is we can say, well, maybe Ibn Amr's reading evolved. What if we try to take certain features, put them back into his reading, and see where he ends up? And so it turns out, if we take sila, which is the lengthening of the uh, uh, pronominal uh, suffix, and put it back in his reading, he ends up in Syria, where we would expect him. And so what this indicates is perhaps his reading went through a process of classicization, an evolution of his reading over time, uh, such that it matched more what we would expect from, from the Iraqi readers uh, out here on the right. Uh, another interesting consequence, and I'll finish with this, uh, is that we see regionality in the readings. And this is important because other early studies that were done on a limited selection of, of words sampled from the, uh, from the Quran, like, uh, uh, like uh, Christopher Meltrit's uh, work, uh, couldn't really tease out any strong indication of regionality. But this more holistic analysis shows us that indeed, uh, there really does appear to be regionality in the readings. And this does reflect at least an, what I would say is a hint of, or a, a strong indication rather, not a hint of authentic transmission 
from those readers uh, as their readings became documented in the books uh, in the uh, subsequent centuries. Uh, and so 